Okay, so let's, uh, so I well, <laughs> welcome back from the coffee break. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Christina Tonneson Friedman from Union College. And uh, she's going to speak uh, to us about Sasaki geometry on sphere bundles over a product of two compact Riemann surfaces. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I really enjoyed this week. Uh, I want to say thank you to the uh, academic staff for making the hybrid version so uh, comfortable. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of great talks this week and uh, posters. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been an avatar. So uh, that was kind of fun yesterday to go in and look at the posters. Um, and yeah, so um, my contribution is um, probably a little more sort of uh, example based. Um, so I chose to talk about a recent paper with uh, Charles Boyer, um, but I decided to focus on a special case within that paper just to sort of for the talk purpose. So it's gonna be very sort of concrete. And then near the end of the talk, I just wanna briefly touch on some emerging work in progress together with Charles and Hong Yin Huang and Evelyn Lechandre. It's very much in its infancy and I take full responsibility if I'm taking saying anything wrong. It's none of the rest of them's fault. You know, I just thought I would give a little preview at the end. Um, but the main part of the talk is about this paper with Charles. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, so the plan for the talk is to very quickly, uh, just to set notation and all that, uh, give an introduction to Kayla and Sasaki geometry. Um, Evelyn's talk yesterday uh, was so great, so some of this is going to be superfluous, but I'm just nevertheless going to go through my, my slides. Um, and then I'm going to explain uh, these Yamasaki fiber joints uh, to the specific example that I'm talking about. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss the existence of the extremal, uh, Sasaki extremal, Sasaki CSE, and, uh, well, quotation, Einstein metrics on these Yamasaki fiber joints. It turns out with the Einstein, there's not uh, a whole lot to get from this example. Uh, well, basically nothing. Uh, but for extremal and CSE, there's some. And then, as I said, a little bit of work in progress near the end. Um, all right, so uh, here uh, N will denote a, a smooth compact manifold of even dimension. And we will assume that there is a complex uh, structure on it. So I'll think about that as a, a tensor um, and that it is integral. Um, and then uh, we have a Riemannian metric that happens to be Hermitian, so invariant under J. And with that, we get a uh, J invariant two form, so type one, one, two form. And if that form is closed, uh, then we have a Kähler manifold, which I'm sure you know everyone know already, but just to set the notation, right? So the Kähler form is omega and the Kähler metric is G. And this, you know, gives us a Kähler class. And if we collect all the second cohomology classes that happens to be able to be represented by a Kähler form, then we Are you still there? We can't hear anything. Yeah, uh, Christina, your your screen is frozen. Part of the Kayla structure. I'm gonna pause a little because I just gotta. Can you all hear me? I, I think my internet yeah. connection just got interrupted yeah, a little bit. Okay. Uh, when the phone rings in this house things freeze. So hopefully it won't ring too much this morning. So, all right. So, you know, so we have a Romanian metric under all this. So we have, of course, a Riemann curvature tensor, and we can take the trace of that to get the Ricci tensor. Uh, that famously gives us the Ricci form. 
uh, that can define the Chen class of this complex manifold. And then if we take the trace again, so to speak, we get the scalar curvature, which is the uh, easiest thing to work with because it's just a function on the manifold. And the special geometries um, starts at the top hierarchy for me is the killer Einstein matrix. Um, so the killer metric happens to be Einstein, which in the killer case means the rigid form is just a constant times the killer form. Um, and uh, constant scalar curvature is second best maybe. And then we can generalize that even further. This has already been mentioned in several talks here by uh, working with the notion of extremal scalar metrics. And one way of saying that is that the gradient of the scalar curvature is a pulling vector field. Um, all right, and here's the hierarchy, right? Kill Einstein implies CSC, which in turn implies extremal. So that's the Kehler special metrics, special Kehler metrics. Um, in Sasakian geometry, so just a quick tour through Sasakian geometry. And again, I apologize, I'm repeating a little bit, but it's been introduced in other talks. Uh, so we think of a Sasakian structure and a smooth manifold of a dimension as a quadruple of a revector field, a contact form, and quote unquote, a complex structure, and a Riemannian metric. Um, right, so the contact form defines the contact bundle. The V vector field is intertwined with the contact form. And this is this phi is uh, if we restrict it to the contact bundle, we get the complex structure on this contact bundle. And the eta is J invariant there. So we have sort of a transverse scalar structure. And here's the full Riemannian metric of the Sasakian structure. So this is sort of the Kela part, if you want, and this is the other part, the part. Um, and the read vector field is assumed to be a killing vector field of G. Um, it will generate a one-dimensional foliation. And as I said, the transfer structure is Kela. And just for the next slide, I'll put a T on when I'm talking about the transfer Kela metric which may just be living locally. It doesn't have to have to be living globally. Um, all right, and another way just to mention is that one can look up to the cone over the Sasaki manifold and there is another Kalo metric there. So this what uh, Charles denote the Sasaki sandwich, right? Um, all right, so that is that. And as Evelyn also mentioned yesterday, one can group the Sasaki structures into sort of three rough groups. They're the regular ones where you have a free action, a free S1 action. And so the quotient of the foliation is actually manifold. That's the regular one. They don't always exist, they could. Uh, Quasi-regular is the second best where at least you have an orbifold quotient. So you can sort of talk about a global transverse kilometric living somewhere else. Um, and then there are the ones that are neither, and these are the irregular, and that would be most of them. Okay. Uh, we can um, not quite rescale Sasagi uh, metrics, but sort of kind of rescale them. So we rescale the, the, the transverse part, and we do this to the, the re part. And so we get rays of Sasagi structures. Um, and uh, as we'll see later, special geometric properties of the Sagi metrics kind of gets preserved by changing in this ray, except for being Einstein. Okay. And then also sort of the fine print that, that sort of always has to be said is that we can we can deform the Sasaki structure, not just by looking around for different re vector fields, but we can also change the, um, the contact form uh, this way. Uh, where phi is a basic, um, basic function. Um, and that corresponds uh, kind of to changing in the transverse scalar class. Uh, so the transverse scalar class is still well-defined, um, you know, whether or not it's, it's regular or not. Uh, but if it happens to be a, a regular or quasi-regular case, then you can think of the class living in the quotient many or all default. Um, so there is this uh, movement that sometimes happens uh, invisibly, like it's almost not 
mentioned, you know, that you're moving in, the, in that. Uh, but the good news is that um, up to isotopy, um, you have the same CR structure, you know, so, so it's not quite the same CR structure when you do that, but it's up to isotopy. Okay. And then there is uh, the movement in the Sasaki cone, um, which we can think of the following way, you fix a maximal torus in the Sasaki automorphism group. And then we can look for the elements in there that satisfies this. And then we get to the so-called unreduced Sasaki cone. Um, there's some equivalence going on there with the wild group, but if we ignore that, then we just have the unreduced one. And if we pick another element in here, we get a new Sasaki structure with the same underlying CR structure. Okay, in that case. So this is sort of two different ways of deforming. Okay. Um, right. So I just occurred to me, I'm not 100% sure I can see if anyone writes in chat. So if you do that, you have a question, just feel free to unmute and interrupt me if I'm not seeing it. So, okay. So what are the Sasaki metrics with special geometric properties that I am interested in here? Well, there are the Eta Einstein ones um, and more special Einstein. So if the transverse scalar structure is Kähler Einstein, then we can say that the Sasaki metric is Eta Einstein. We have to say Eta Einstein because it's not guaranteed it's Einstein. Um, and that's preserved in the ray. So being Eta Einstein is preserved by the ray. Okay, if the transverse scalar Einstein structure has positive scalar curvature, then one of the Sasaki structures in the given eta Einstein ray is actually Einstein. So that's the metric that's called Sasaki Einstein. Um, and uh, that, of course, carries some obstructions. Uh, we need the first gen class of the contact bundle to be a torsion class. Uh, and for most, cases I'm looking at, that means that we want it to vanish. Um, so there's some, some things that has to be sorted out before you can look for Sasaki Einstein. All right. And just a reminder, when I say something is Eta Einstein, I really mean up to isotopy. So might allow myself to move in that Kähler class, transverse Kähler class. All right, um, CSC and Extremo, a little bit easier in a way. Um, so a Sasaki structure has constant scalar curvature if and only if the transverse scalar, stru uh, scalar structure has trans uh, uh, context scalar curvature. And if you look at Evelyn's talk yesterday, that was clear, right? Because the two uh, differ by 2n, uh, the dimension. So, so, you know, they differ by constant, the full scalar curvature and the transverse one. And again, this is preserved in the ray. So a ray is CSC, uh, if and only if one of the elements in the ray is CSC. And as has also been said in earlier talks, that CSC uh, can be generalized to Sasaki Extremal, uh, which was done by Boyer and Galegi and Samanga, so that um, the Sasaki structure is extremal if and only if the transverse scalar structure is extremal. So, you know, if this is local, then that's why I use the notion of the gradient of the scalar curvature being um, a killing field rather than talking about minimizers and so on. Okay. All right. Um, and again, extremal is coming in rays. And again, fine print. When I say something is CSC is extremal, I mean up to isotopy. Okay, so that is that. So that was sort of the background. Um, and uh, now let me go into the examples that I wanna talk about, these Yamasaki fiber joints. So the upshot is that uh, Yamasaki introduced these fiber joints for K-contact structures. And what we did in the paper was we extended it to Sasaki structures. And uh, for the purpose of the talk, you know, as I said, I'll stick to a very special case uh, that happens to be uh, super admissible, which was a phrase we came up with for the paper. I don't know if we'll catch up, but uh, catch on. Uh, but I'll tell you later what it means. It's just a practical thing that makes it a little bit easier to study these things. 
Okay. So first I need a base, uh, and the base will be formed by two compact Riemann surfaces of genus G1 and G2. And then I'll pick a constant curvature unit volume Kähler form on those Riemann surfaces. So specifically, it means that the Ricci form is two times the genus minus one times omega i. Okay, and then the scalar curvature is whatever it is according to your conventions. Uh, okay. All right, it's constant, of course. Um, and uh, now, if you take the product of those two, it's completely straightforward that the Kähler cone is simply the span of the classes of those two when you think of them pulled back to S. That's, you know, straightforward. So we have full control over the Kähler cone of S in this case. All right, and I want to say in general, Yamazagi and, and also in our paper, S could be something else and, and we may not have full overview of the Kähler cone, right? But we have in this case. All right, and then we have to pick some line bundles on S. And the way we'll do it is we will We'll take a holomorphic line bundle over S so that the first churn class um, is given by this. So a linear combination of these two classes where we will assume the constants here are positive, okay? And so we're picking four positive integers uh, and I'm picking two line bundles, right? So four positive integers and I could collect those in a matrix. So we'll call that K. And so up to multiplying by flat holomorphic line bundles, this choice of matrix K tells us our choice, All right? And note that because of the assumptions on these Ks, uh, the churn classes of Li are in the Kähler cone of S, okay? Um, so, uh, and each of these churn classes also defines as one bundle over S. So let's call that Mi. And Li, you know, can be identified by this associated bundle to this uh, S1 bundle. And now that means that this is actually also a Sasaki structure, right? So for each of these line bundles, there's a natural Sasaki structure over the same base S, okay? Um, and here is just part of the technicalities. You didn't want to do all of it, right? So Di is equal to this, okay? Good. All right. So now we define the fiber join of those two Sasaki structures. Okay, where this is the notation and F just stands for fiber, not a function or anything. All right, so the way we do it is we, we actually take the dual of these line bundles and we add them up, we take the direct sum. Uh, then we equip each of them with a Hermitian metric. Um, so we have a norm and polar coordinates. And then we take the, uh, the sphere bundle that arises, right? This is a four dimensional tangent bundle. And then we just set this equal to one. And then we have a S3 bundle over S, okay? All right. Um, and then uh, it turns out, and that's in our papers, um, that, and part of it is of course Yamasaki, right? The, the K contact part of it is that this has a natural uh, CR structure and it has a family of compatible Sasaki structures, which are really determined by a choice of a point in the first uh, quadrant of the plane like this. And so this is uh, sort of, you know, part of the Sasaki cone, okay? Um, and here's part of the technical part of it, right? So D eta A for each of these choices of A looks like this. We have to restrict to S3, of course, right? To the bundle. Okay, and here's the transverse scalar metric. So we get these, um, you know, this, this, this uh, fiber joint construction gives us a smooth Sasaki manifold and it gives us this family of Sasaki structures. Okay. And if I had picked um, 
the genus of each of my sigmas are uh, bigger than one, right? There's not much going on on the, the, those Riemann surfaces in terms of, of symmetry. There's nothing going on. So this actually gives us the entire unreduced Sasaki curl. Okay, but in general, one has to be careful. This is a proper subcone sub of the Sasaki curl. So it doesn't necessarily give us the whole thing. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, so that's these this family of Sasagi metrics, and uh, now I want to talk about what does the regular ray quotient look like. Christina, sorry, I have a question. Is yeah, Sure. Uh, can we think about this as uh, S one bundle over the projectivization of? Um, uh, yes, L1? because yeah, yeah, because that's exactly what now the the regular ray is. Yes, yes, you can. That's right. So here it is, right? So the quotient is, um, it's equal to the projectization of this, as, as this is said, right? So, and then, you know, if you go backwards, you can just say it's the booth B1 over this. All right, okay. Um, and um, if you look at this, um, this is, uh, you know, this is when it starts to seem very familiar to, to, to me, because uh, this just looks like uh, one of those so-called admissible projective bundles um, that I work with, with um, Vestislav Apostolo, David Calderbang, Paul Claude Schoen, um, more than a decade ago, All right, but here they are. Um, so that's what it is. Um, and um, not only that, if we look at the, so, so when we take a quotient of a, of a Sasaki uh, ray um, or a Sasaki structure, we don't just get the complex manifold, we also get a, a Kähler class with that. And if the Kähler cone is big on the quotient, uh, there's a little bit of a, you know, unknown, like what, what do you hit and is it a good Kähler class or not? So uh, in this case, one can check that what we get, uh, well, it's not so surprising because these are, this is, this is how the Kähler classes look on this quotient. But so um, the transverse Kähler class looks like this, where this is the Poincaré and dual of the sum of the, the zero and infinity sections of this bundle. And if we noodle with that a little bit, we can recognize it as one of those admissible classes in, in this collaboration with uh, Apostolo, Calderbang, and Godishan. Um, and for the people who are into the technicalities of that paper, here's how to work out what Ri or in the old paper Xi looks. Okay. And now, I mean, I chose this example for the talk because, you know, in this case, all the Kähler classes are quote unquote admissible. And that's why we say they're super admissible, that this is a super admissible case. Okay. All right. So we have the dictionary to get from these Yamazaki um, fiber joints, the, the regular uh, quotient down to this admissible case. Um, but before we get too sort of happy about all this, um, I just want to sort of show an example that illustrates this, this thing about what Kähler class you land in can, can be a little bit annoying, right? So, so let's say I'd like to recreate uh, the Koisus Akarna manifold. This one here it famously has a Kähler-Einstein manifold, uh, a Kähler-Einstein structure, right? And uh, okay, fine. Um, if I choose my case this way, I certainly get this one. But then when I work out these parameters giving me the, the uh, Kähler class, this is what I get. And if you look at that, these case are positive, right? I can't hit a half and minus a half, okay? Which happens to be the marker of the Chen class of this one. So you don't add.
Christina, your your uh, screen froze again. Was there a question? And I got an unstable internet connection again. So, but all right. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it actually, um, it's not so bad, right? Because we get some of the CSCK metrics that also live on this manifold. We get some of them, not all of them, some of them. Okay. So that is that. All right. Now, some of these fiber joints actually already appeared in, in earlier work uh, with Charles. Um, and let me explain explain how that comes about. So uh, I want to relate this to the, um, the S3W uh, joints that we worked with earlier. So, so here it goes. So one can show um, just directly that um, there is a quasi-regular ray that gives a product quotient if and only if the determinant of K, this matrix K is zero, and that's if and only if these two as vectors are collinear, okay? And in that case, these two line bundles are kind of related because the churn class are just two different, uh, potentially two different um, constants times a common Kähler class, primitive Kähler class, okay? And uh, so here's the, nitty gritty of that. And the way you then recreate this product is you pick A to be that W that's equal to this, where there's a bunch of GCD going on here. Okay. All right. And then we can just say that, um, you know, both of the line bundles are just a power of a common line bundle, at least up to tentering by a flat holomorphic line bundle. All right. And we're going to say um, that that case is called collinear. And for that collinear uh, fiber join, um, this quasi-regular ray that gives the product uh, as above is really just uh, one of those S3W joints that we have in earlier papers. Um, and for that reason, uh, we're going to call that case cone decomposable. And um, so in the collinear case, we've kind of already been there, uh, so to speak, uh, looking for special metrics. So the interesting thing for now is like when the determinant of K is not zero, right? Then there's something new to think about. A little bit of uh, topology, and that is courtesy of Charles. Uh, that's his expertise. Uh, but here's, so, so here's the cohomology. Um, of these fiber joints. Um, and as you can see, um, the fourth cohomology group, there's some torsion that we can't get rid of because we're assuming all these numbers are positive. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and also, um, if the Euler number is odd, the determinant of K cannot be zero. So MK is non collinear. And we'll see in a moment, it's also non spin. Uh, because this one is zero if and only if these two sums are both even. So if you play with the numbers, you can see that's not possible. Okay. All right. Um, so now, um, actually, so now I'm, I'm starting to delve into the existence question of these special metrics. So are there any questions on sort of the setup for now before I go on? Yeah, there's a question from the audience. Okay. Um, is there a reason why this setup wouldn't work for, uh, say, uh, the sum of uh, three line, uh, the fiber, um, the sum of three line bundles and three um, uh, mm -hmm. Riemann surfaces, n Riemann surfaces and n line bundles? Oh, or it, oh yeah. So, so it's completely, completely more general. general. Right, yeah, see, it's, it's much more general. Yes, so you, you can take, uh, you know, many more line bundles and all that. Um, sure, absolutely. This example made it easier to talk about the collinear case. So I had to avoid talking about more general admissible cases and so on. Uh, but yeah, this can be much more general. And, and you don't even have to have S be a product of something, right? It could just be some interesting Kähler manifold. 
with lots of different line bonds. So, yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, so, so let's talk. So, so for now, the title is, uh, there's an Einstein thrown in there, but um, that will quickly go away. So first of all, for the collinear case, right? So this is already well explored because we've done, you know, all this stuff on these S3W joints. Um, so here's a little part of that, right? So first of all, in the collinear case, we know that there is a CSC revector field in the W cone, which is basically the same as this cone. So again, remember, this is not necessarily the entire Sasaki cone. Um, and for small genus, um, that uh, W cone, aka this part of the cone from the Yamasaki fiber joint, is exhausted by extremal Sasaki metrics. So uh, put a pin in that too, because later we will see that we can drop the collinear assumption on that. Um, all right. And then if you if you just explore the collinear case, you will very quickly say see that the only Sasaki Einstein case that pops out here is the completely trivial one. Okay. Um, and that can be seen directly from working with the with these S3W joints, but we can actually say it in more generality. Uh, regardless of whether we are in the collinear case or non-collinear case. So this is um, the next slide because uh, we can work out, and this is in the paper, what the germ class is of this contact bundle. And if you look at the last line here, right, these, this part here and this part here can't vanish because these cases are positive. So the only way this can vanish is if this first term here and this first term here is positive, but that can only happen if G1 and G2 was zero, right? And, and then you don't even, and you just get two here and two here. So that forces this and this and this and this to be one. So that's that. And then you just get a trivial case, okay. So there is not a whole lot to, to come for for the Sasaki Einstein metrics, at least not in my special example. Uh, so this is, you know, admittedly, that's a little bit of an artifact of the fact that I chose this example to talk about. But it is actually, it seems to be that in general for these Yamazaki fiber joints, the restrictions you get for looking for Sasaki Einstein are pretty severe. So it's not so easy to get Sasaki Einstein examples. Uh, and probably the ones you get are sort of maybe already seen from other reasons. So we will drop the Einstein from the title here and just uh, uh, content ourselves to look for extremal and CSC. Okay. And we can start with some, um, and now I'm not assuming, you know, Collinear. I'm just uh, non-collinear. In some sense, it could be collinear, but that's already done. So assume non-collinear, and we'll see what we can get just for looking at the regular ray. Okay. Well, for the regular ray, um, and for genus uh, less than or equal to one for each of these pieces. This is already well known that these have extremal metrics in all the Kähler classes. And that's due to Andy Wong and Dan Guan. And, um, and then because of the openness result in the Sasaki cone due to Boya, Galigi, and Simanga, we can then say near the regular ray, we have also extremal. Okay. So that is that. And then we can go into sort of the details um, a little bit of uh, this, this construction that is behind that. And um, the, the paper I have at Apostolo, Gorishan and Calderbang, um, you know, is exploring that and you can sort of just play with the numbers a little bit. And so it turns out, you know, that you can, you can prove that if you, um, pick one of the genus to be zero. So one of your pieces is CP1, but then you allow the other piece to have a higher genus. Okay, so any higher genus. And then you pick your, your matrix K to be this. 
okay? Uh, which unless the genus is two is non-collinear, right? Um, then the regular ray uh, gives a quotient that has extremal scalar metrics in all scalar classes, which then means that in particular, the scalar class you happen to hit um, is extremal. So you get a similar result to up here. Just by just looking into a little bit, you know, this, we know when I write this extremal and these admissible ones, it has to do with some stability thing. You need something to be positive. So you can go in and check that. Okay. So that is that. Uh, and now there are even some regular rays that have CSC metrics. Um, and uh, that again, if you go back to this paper, I have it listed at the end of the talks to the, the paper uh, with the others from 2008. Um, you can apply those results to our case and, and just you know, work it out and see that we can get regular rays that are CSCs. Uh, in the following cases, for example, it's not like we exhausted all the options, right? So we said the genus equal to each other. Um, then we have lots and lots of them, right? So here and here, these are not so hard, but then when it's a higher genus, a little more work. And here's one uh, with some bizarre restraint here, but that comes from wanting a certain polynomial not to go negative on us. Um, so stability to hold. And then just for the fun of it, uh, here are some really sporadic examples with some high genuses, right? So, so that can be done. And, um, you know, it's not like all I'm doing is reporting from some old work, you know, just applying it to this case. Um, but at least there is something, okay? So now uh, comes sort of the, um, the dangerous part of my talk, the one I'm most nervous about because I'm, you know, this is a work in progress a little bit. Um, and as I said before, I take full responsibility for any wrong sayings I, I do. It's not my collaborator's fault. So, um, all right. So the question is, what about all the other rays in that um, potentially sub cone of our Sasaki cone? What can we say about those? All right. And here's a little bit of a concession. So in the non-collinear case, so we don't have these S3W joins. Uh, we did not study the quasi-regular quotients uh, maybe you should say yet, because maybe one day we will, and much less the transverse scalar classes on these quotients, which means we don't have uh, the option to just look up existence results on scalar manifolds from earlier work, right? So we're a little bit in the dark on what is going on in the rest of this cone. And so we're gonna leave the, the realm of this paper that uh, the first part of the talk was about, and then uh, go into the unknown of this, okay? But the very good news is uh, that um, due to the, 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 the very recent, or relatively recent, and very exciting uh, work that Evelyn talked about yesterday uh, by Vestislav Bustolov, David Calderbang, and Evelyn, the Chandra, and I'm just gonna call them ACL for now, because I'm gonna refer to them for a while. Uh, there is another way to go about it. So there is a way out of trying to understand the quotients and doing Kähler geometry. Um, And uh, at the moment, uh, Charles and Hong Yun Huang and Evelyn and I are trying to explore this more uh, for various cases and various open questions. It's very much in the beginning of the works. Uh, so all I'm gonna do is just for this particular Yamasaki fiber join, I will just mention some early observations that come from that. Um, and I hope that I'm doing it justice. Okay, so, so here we go. So what we know um, about the regular quotients. So I'm actually gonna look a little bit at 
with the regular quotient still um, is the following. So these are these admissible manifolds, right? And um, there is a background moment map, moment map um, for these. We can assume it takes value in that. Um, with respect to a background so-called admissible metric uh, in the quotient Keller class. And then other admissible Keller metrics in the same Keller class. So remember that would give Sasaki structures in the same isotopic class uh, can be defined by choosing smooth functions f of z, uh, satisfying some endpoint conditions. Uh, I won't be too specific, uh, it has to vanish at plus minus one. It has to have a positive slope of a certain value at negative one, a negative slope at a certain value at plus one, and then uh, a positivity condition. So the function has to be positive in between, right? And so any choice of, of a smooth function like that <clears throat> excuse me, will give you a new admissible metric. That is, you know, long established uh, theory, um, starting with um, Calabi and Koizu-Sakana constructions and Guan and Wang and Lebrun and many others. Um, this is just one way of presenting it. And now, uh, we can we can use that um, to sort of exhibit a special case of this uh, ACL's result in action, and this is just a naive user user's perspective uh, view on this. Um, so let's say we pick a real number b, and we make sure that the size of b is at least one. So the numerical value of it, it well, is greater than one. Okay, and then we add that to our moment map set. And then that is going to be either purely negative or purely positive. So whatever it is, we take the absolute value. So now we have a positive function, okay? And now the moment map is in particular killing potential, adding a constant, still killing potential, right? And then uh, the theory of, of um, Apostolova and Kolobang is we can pull that back up to MK, and then that can determine another, another Sasaki structure in the Sasaki code. Okay, so that will give us another revector field that happens to commute with the one we started with. And this structure is extremal up to isotopy if and only if the original admissible Kähler class of the regular quotient allows a so called admissible weighted extremal Kähler metric as defined by Ladili, right? So this was the discovery of um, Kolderbang and Apostolo that there is this partnership between the extremal metrics and the weighted extremal metrics where this, this weight here, five, is the, the right choice here because of the dimension of our Zazagi uh, manifold. Okay, so, now, um, sort of luckily or whatever, um, from joint work with, with uh, Vesti, uh, Abstolo, and Guido Meschler, uh, we actually already know uh, how we can find a function f of z uh, on these admissible metrics, um, admissible manifolds that would give such a metric up to the condition of the positivity. So that's the sticky point, and this is related to all this very difficult stability um, uh, study that's being done by Apostolo and Ladili and others, and, and I won't try to, to be smart about that, uh, but that's the, that's the thing that makes it a little hard, right? Okay. So it's, and, and finding this, it's just, you know, some ODE, you know, you solve. It's kind of same business as constructing extremal admissible metrics. Now it's just some other ODE, okay? But there's more, there's more, because once you find, uh, let's pretend, you know, that you find this, this F and it's positive, all is good the so-called weighted scalar curvature of that is an affine function of the moment map, okay? And we saw in Evelyn's talk yesterday, to get the scalar curvature of the corresponding extremal metric, we have to divide 
by that killing uh, this killing potential we use to change the Sasaki metric. So in our case, that's C plus B absolute value. All right, so we need an affine function over another affine function to be constant. Okay, but that can be that can be checked. Everything. So first you work out for a given b, you find your f, then um, you write out the the weighted scalar curvature. You demand that it's a constant times this, and then you get an equation on b. And it's an algebraic equation. You just want it to be a root of a certain polynomial uh, that I not accidentally named F. F stands for Futaki. And if you look in Appendix B, I think of the paper by ACL, uh, there's some discussion about this Futaki invariant um, that comes out. OK, good. So, and now for our fiber joints, it actually turns out that when the genus is less than or equal to one for our fiber joints, we can do a root counting argument exactly like uh, Wong and Guan did for extremal metrics to verify that our F, which is just a polynomial, is uh, satisfying positivity. And that's in the work with uh, Apostolo and Meshla. Okay, so we know that we have these extremal, and so that gives us the first sort of observation that whether or not we are in the collinear case or the non collinear case, it seems like the sub cone is exhausted by extremal Sasaki metrics. Okay, all right. And um, now, um, we can dig into that particular case a little bit more. Uh, we can explicitly write down f of b, okay? And it turns out that if the initial class we start with is not CSC, right? So the Futaki invariant of the original Kähler class of the regular quotient, it's not vanishing. That actually makes this f an odd degree polynomial and near plus and minus one. So near B equal to plus or minus one. So formally we can plug it in, right? But it's not really defined when B is plus or minus one. It has the same sign. So you have a polynomial with the same sign at plus and minus one, it's odd degree. So there's gonna to have to be a root either on the uh, left side of minus one or on the right side of plus one. It just has to be there. And so that tells us that there is at least one CSC ray in the Sasaki kill of this. And it happens to appear within this cone here, okay? So that is, uh, that's the preview. I think these things can be done much more generally. This is just one example of it. Um, are there any, any questions or comments? No? All righty. Um, well, I think. Does Charles have a question? <laughs> oh. Very, no, I, I just, uh, very nice talk, Christina. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, so maybe we should uh, thank uh, the speaker first. Yeah. And uh, see if there are further questions from the room. I'm just gonna put, put yeah, this best, yeah, I have a question. So can you uh, try to do the same type of calculus if you take um, projectivization of some of three line bundles and S1 bundle over that? Um, you will be not doing, dealing with all these, but there is a very uh, a nice uh, theory of uh, doctoric uh, 
way that it's momentous in that case, which is quite. Oh, good. I guess. So with three, uh, so this this is a this is a bad answer, but of course you know if if you have a, a sort of a boring blow up, you can have three, right? You can have two of the line bundles with the same. Um, so let's see. So so the way that 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 I did this and we did this was we looked at the admissible setup, right? Where we can we can work out the Futaki invariant and we can work out um, the f of b directly. So now with three with three line bundles in general, you don't have the admissible, we have some generalized Calabi construction. And I don't know how explicit one can be about the extremal metrics and the weighted extremal. Is, is there some like, how, how explicit is it? I know Evelyn has an existence result there, right? But it will is be, it explicit? Not, not, not explicit, but still we may have abstract existence theorems for yeah. on, the, on the fiber, which is CP2. It's a yeah. variety. There, there are some abstract yeah. existence theorems. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, it might be that, you know, this the non vanishing of the Fotaki invariant where you start sort of guarantees that it will vanish somewhere else. It might be that, you know. So, that being said, I mean, you can also accidentally start in a class that's unstable vanishing for talking invariant, and then you may not get any CSC in that cone. Right. Any, any more questions? So I should say, you know, here's the references and, and the one in red, uh, they're the ones that I'm just uh, I'm just a fan of, right? I have nothing to do with them, but th these are the ones that are, you know, helping helping us um, giving these existence things. All right. Oh, in that case, uh, sh maybe we thank the speaker again, and then we adjourn for lunch. <laughs>